Perfect. So, welcome back. Happy Saturday morning. The best place to stream teams on a Saturday morning. Uh, Innovation and Dolly, thank you for making the effort to be here. Uh, we have a special meeting. I think all our meetings are, have been wonderful the past uh, two sessions, and we're going to continue that today, um, particularly with the call and request from the, the students who said, can we bring in alums? Can we bring in people who are working in this space, who have experience? And it, we have a lot of trailblazers here in and from the MBA program or alums uh, who have experience in this type of area um, and want to give back to the community. So uh, we do have a special guest uh, who will be sharing his experience about innovation, innovative organizations, and different transitions and, and what, it, what he's learned over this period of time. But before we get into that, I do want to share that uh, congratulations for meeting more of the halfway mark, I guess, of the course. So we are week four out of six but I did provide feedback for your midterm presentations, and I want to suggest I'm very proud of, of, of where you guys, uh, what you guys submitted. Uh, you certainly took that, and it seems like every, every iteration of the class or um, there becomes more engagement, and then definitely using the tools either from this class, embedding it, being clear, concise with their narrative. I um, mean, I do have some some points later on that I would like to address maybe after. Uh, the guest has, has uh, shared um, his insights, but um, I'm really proud and happy. And then just a reminder, we'll be moving on into um, module three, which covers different nuances of open innovation, particularly open innovation as a service, business models, and then how it's expanded into, we'll say, government uh, or public administration. And there's a new uh, podcast from Henry Chesbro, the founder who coined open innovation um, and he's talking about how open innovation can be utilized or is being utilized in this recovery of not just of the economy but the recovery of health services and meeting the demands within this crisis i did post that through the the chat um, and then I'm, I'm happy to share that other ways but it, it's it's a unique way of how open innovation is specifically addressing in this current current time so that's some few things that we will talk about uh, after um, our our guest and alum shares his insight. But uh, maybe we can just go around the room and share maybe your name and what field or industry or maybe career path you're looking for, which could help our our guest um, know a bit about and maybe you know impromptu tailor something. So maybe we want to share. There, there's three. There's four of us on the. On the five of us on the call, but three are in the MBA pro or in the in the course. So maybe you guys can share. Stacy, why don't you start? You sure. Um, I'm Stacy Haggerty, and I currently work for Tech Data as a business development manager. And in my current role, I actually do get to um, have some room for innovation, which is great. It's not just such a in the box type of role anymore as it would have been in the past for our organization. Uh, it's specifically in the IT industry, but um, in distribution. So I get to work with AMD microprocessors, um, uh, semiconductor processors every day, and uh, also companies like HP, Lenovo, uh, Acer, and Dell. Yang Kang, why don't you go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Yang Kang Sukumani. Uh, I, I. Uh, I was born and raised in China, and four years ago, I come to the U.S. for the master uh, education. And right now, I'm working for a local accounting firm to do tax filing and bookkeeping. Uh, before I come to the U.S., I work for uh, animation and the multimedia industry. So, uh, and also in that company, I mainly focus on marketing and uh, international business development. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Gisela, maybe you want to kick it off and then we have Ray, I see, joined us as well. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Gisela Kennedy. I did my undergrad at Florida State a million years ago, joined the Army as an officer, worked in the Transportation Corps, and now I work at the VA here in St. Pete at the Bay Pines VA. I am what we call a medical management specialist, but what that actually means is I am the 
administrative person that supports the clinical services. So I have all the ologies that are not surgical. So um, it's been a really interesting time for me at work. And uh, like what Stacy was saying, you know, in an in the box role or an in the box type organization, I'm a Lean Six Six, uh, Lean Six Sigma green belt. And so I'm always trying to find ways to innovate and to uh, make small changes over time, right? So Kaizen in my area. And so um, it's been really fun and challenging and every day, every day is a little bit different. So that's the goal. Thanks. Cool. Ready? Share just uh, your background maybe. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hey, my name is Raymond Mack. I got my undergrad degree from Florida State University as well in mechanical engineering. Go Knowles. <laughs> and uh, uh, I work at a hydraulics company right now and I'm my current role is a quality auditor, part of the business systems and quality systems, just kind of supporting the quality management system and helping document and develop processes as needed. Um, so I've seen innovation from like the manufacturing perspective and kind of from different aspects of the business, from supply chain to manufacturing to R&D and engineering design. So um, I look forward to learning about all these new concepts. I think they're pretty neat. Wonderful. Thank you, friends. Um, I would like to turn the floor over to not just an alum of the MBA program here at USF, but a big, big advocate of these courses who in fact took this course and management design at a time, which was the first time it launched maybe five or six years ago. And it was a time when both of these courses were grouped into one, uh, one course, and we were trying to rapidly cover all these topics and everything, uh, but has moved on to have experience in the innovation space as a career uh, with a company that probably historically has a historical um, long history and, and structure of, of um, being kind of a legacy company, but trying to pivot to, to a, a, a different approach to its market. Um, and I'm happy to share and, and happy that he's agreed to come back and share his experience with us uh, and his journey and just provide some insight. So I would like to give the floor to Euros and let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you, you're too kind. So my first comment is, I guess a group of five people probably could not be more diverse in terms of backgrounds and industry. So that's really exciting. Um, and uh, I'll share a little bit about myself. Um, I was a IT consultant. I graduated like Gisela probably quite a few years ago uh, in a, with a degree in math. Uh, and um, I consulted for about 20 years. Um, I ended up uh, looking for a different career path and wanted to kind of advance. So I got my MBA at, at St. Pete um, four years ago now. Uh, part of my curriculum was um, Professor Diasio's or Steve's class, which was one of the highlights for sure, as you guys are probably coming to understand uh, in your education. And uh, after that, I worked for two companies in the area. So one of the companies uh, was Borsed, which is your meat and cheese provider at Publix, if you know who they are. And that was on an innovation team that was dedicated. And now I work for Baycare Health System, which is a healthcare company based in Clearwater. So you should be familiar with both of those. Um, so that's as a way of an introduction. Um, I'm going to put up some slides on the screen and, and give you some apologies about the quality of those slides. Uh, this presentation came around quick, but I'm uh, I, one thing I will say is make sure uh, I wanted to make sure this was an interactive thing. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, regarding your area, your field, I'm more than happy to stop. And uh, I want this to really be an interactive presentation versus me talking at you for, for a few minutes. Uh, and I may even pause if I talk too much. I may even pause and ask you guys some questions about how this may translate into your industry. So I hope that's okay. And uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here for sure. So I'm going to put something up, and you guys can let me know if you see it. You guys see the presentation? Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I really want this. To, I'm going to present and talk about a, quite a few things. And, um, you know, we may go into different areas in terms of the conversation. But if you have any comments and different things, uh, these are just meant to be thought starters. And 
one of these things that I, you know, I termed a presentation innovation um, x real life, because um, what happens after you leave the MBA program, and as you guys probably know <clears throat> by now, being in the corporate world for a while, innovation is probably not as clean and simple when it comes to the real world. So I wanted to give you some examples of what innovation looks like in a real life scenario, in a corporate scenario, uh, and where you might find opportunities and pitfalls. So the first thought is that, you know, innovation is hard. So innovation in its, in its uh, basis is, a, is change. Uh, so change in general is stuff for human beings, and there is complete volumes of work being written on change management and how, how to promote change. So what you'll find in a corporate setting uh, and what has been my experience is that dealing with a change manage, management portion of innovation is probably one of the most important things because whether you are a part of a dedicated innovation team or whether your role has some wiggle room for innovation, at the end of the day, you have to either socialize that change among the company, among your peers, or socialize it um, externally. And all those things present a challenge. Uh, and I don't know how much you guys talked about the adoption um, life cycle of innovation, but essentially it, it kind of looks like a normal curve, but it's not. So you have um, out of the 100% of people, let's say in a flat social setting, 2.5% would be your innovators. Um, about 13% are your early adopters, which gives you a 16% kind of adoption rate, but the adoption rate for something to tip into full scale usage in the company is 25%. So from a numbers perspective, you have a gap there that has to be crossed somehow. Uh, and again, this is in a social setting where everybody's equal. Uh, that That's not how companies work. So you, you know that the word of a CEO or uh, a VP is gonna be worth more than somebody that's on the front line. So uh, especially if you're socializing from a frontline position, meaning you're an analyst, you're, you're, you're a worker bee, you're um, you know, a, a middle manager up, it's gonna, be, uh, it's gonna be difficult to do that. So one of the things that, um, two things that I think are important to realize is, you know, innovation is not an isolated concept. So if you're innovating, uh, make sure that people that are gonna be taking this idea and executing it are buying in early. And the way you do that is um, let's say you have an idea. Um, um, let's say you have an idea, uh, Ray, for instance, in, in mechanical engineering that's going to revolutionize how you guys do cer certain things for hydraulics. You may want to bring in people that are actually going to be making the product early to give you their feedback. Because what you'll find is these cross-functional teams may have a different, uh, a lot of different perspectives. Um, the second thing is you need to get a top-down um, agreement. So um, a lot of times, you know, the culture of your company may not be suited for innovation. So getting a sponsor that's an executive or getting somebody that's going to be a champion for what you're doing early is, is also very, very important. Um, I had the fortune of working for a company that had the owner that was really, you know, um, into the innovation and wanted to do this. And he created a dedicated team. Uh, and that is quite different than most of your situations, I'm assuming, because you're probably trying to work from the ground up to get innovation going in some areas. And uh, there's going to be uh, obviously a lot of issues, uh, not even with the bureaucracy, but the culture of the company. So um, the other thing that may help you, and if you're doing ground up innovation in a company, uh, make sure you have a business case. So put together a small draft of a business case because uh, a lot of times innovation will fail in those areas like finance um, and um, uh, and people will ask to see, you know, wh why are we gonna, why do we want to do this? Is this going to profit us? Is it going to save us money? How is this going to help us? And having a draft business case with a semblance of an ROI and numbers helps a lot because you're speaking the language those people speak in those departments. So, um, so that's that's I guess the the opener. The other thing that I wanted to talk about is. You know, innovation, you guys have learned the definition probably in module one, what innovation is, what open innovation is. Uh, bear in mind that innovation may not be the same thing for every company. So we talked about mechanical engineering where your innovation may be a lot more um, closer to what people consider to be innovative, which is maybe you'll find a new widget or a new gasket that, that's, that saves you money or, or makes the product perform better. 
uh, innovation in healthcare may be completely different. So maybe, um, you know, Gisela's working in VA, maybe she's going to come up with a process that's a little bit different uh, and that streamlines things, and that's going to be innovation. So, so my, my point there is you're going to find yourself in a real life setting in a company. Um, you know, not every innovation is going to be as radical and as groundbreaking as you want it to be. And most likely you're going to get, you know, those corners rounded off eventually. So, but it shouldn't prevent you from putting ideas in their integral, integral version as you start. So um, find out what innovation means in your environment and work with those parameters. It doesn't mean that you can't work around them. It doesn't mean that you're in a box, but find out what's, what is innovation, what's acceptable. And you're going to find that culture change in organizations is gradual. There's very few organizations, especially of a large size, that, that can change overnight. So if you're going to be an evangelist, if you're going to be a champion for innovation, maybe that innovation starts as a gradual incremental thing that you prove yourself uh, with smaller th things and then you get more credit to do different things. So, so you, you know, innovation in, in general, uh, other than large scale innovation, like, you know, iPhone was a very innovative product and I'll talk about that later, but in general, it's a slow moving process and it is a grind. So we expect to, you know, we always think of innovation and we want it to be this eureka moments that you're sitting in a room and somebody comes up with a new equation or a new process and that's usually not the way it happens. It's a, you know, painstaking process and a grind that may take days or weeks or months to um, find, socialize, and then, you know, prototype and design and test and implement. So uh, just, you know, be ready for the long haul is what I'm saying and find out what innovation means in your environment because it may not be the same. Um, the, one of the reasons innovation is hard uh, is this is what you usually come up with in a in a in a social setting or corporate setting. Um, I made this cart, which I don't know if you've seen before, but you essentially have people like let's say 10% of the people that are really um, you know really excited to innovate. Uh, they may be people that want to do things differently. Uh, you have about 80% of the people that are on the cart. Uh, and they're saying, let's wait and see. I'm not going to be the first adopter. I'm going to see how this works out. And if it works out, I'll go along. If it doesn't, I'm going to jump out of this cart. And then you have a few people that not, are not only standing by, but in a real life scenario, maybe pushing back and saying, this is not going to work. This is never going to work. We've done it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've worked for people that have said, we've done it this way for a long time. Why change it? Why, you know, why, why break something? Why fix something that's not broken? So this is what you come up and come up against in organizations. And the important thing here is that, uh, you know, if you look at the analogy of the cart, yes, the cart is heavy and there's going to be very few people moving it. But once the cart gets moving, it's going to go faster and faster. So uh, innovation is also when you talk about culture and changing the companies that find innovation beneficial, which all of them should. But the ones that actually buy into the topic and actually invest the time and resources are going to be the ones that the culture changes and everything is looked from a different perspective. And that changes a lot of things, uh, you know, from from a standpoint of current economy and uh, what we do in terms of services and products. A lot of companies are going to be looking at the same consumer base, some of the same products and the companies are kind of consolidating. So you, companies are looking for something to put them on top. And th these things like in innovative things are going to be things that give you a competitive advantage. So um, you're going to see what I've seen in my experience is a lot of companies are coming up with dedicated innovation departments. Uh, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit later. W when you're in an organization, most of the people that are not involved in innovation either perceive it as an added thing they need to do, which is somewhere on the bottom of their list prior of priorities or something that, it, you know, a group of four or five nerds in a room is thinking up and they have to execute. So you don't want to fall into either one of those pitfalls. But the biggest thing there is, you know, innovation is going to is here to stay. Uh, whatever term it may we may use, uh, companies are going to have to use it because the competitive market out there is getting, you know, the market is getting more competitive for every single industry. So you, you're going to have to find something as a company that puts you on top uh, or you're going to get essentially swallowed up. So uh, with this consolidation, with this like, um, with with the market the way it is, with all the industries kind of like coming together and having just a few main players, this is more important than ever. So 
innovation as a skill is going to become, I, I predict just, just from my experience, a very useful thing to have on your resume. It may be a differentiator in a lot of fields. It may not be a differentiator, let's say, in accounting, but in terms of like product development, process development, uh, marketing, international business, it's going to be a huge thing. Um, think about the current situation with uh, COVID. You know, we are living now in a virtual world where we educate um, via video. We uh, work via video and uh, we're all remote. So having like I'll talk about my organization that's very, very they pride themselves in their culture and their like team events. We have to find a way to translate that into a virtual setting, which is very difficult. But this is what you know, this is the situation we're in. How do we innovate? How do we bring people together and maintain that culture in the setting? So um, every single, I think, challenge that comes in a corporate setting is an opportunity for innovation. Uh, and it's really a way of thinking. And I know you guys are learning that this semester, but it's really changing people's minds. And it's really giving people the license to say something out of the box. And that's huge. And I'll get to that in a, in a moment. But you're going to find that uh, one of the books, uh, and I would suggest you guys reading this if you're interested in marketing, especially, um, is was it Yang Kang was in marketing or had a marketing background? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So one of the books, uh, a gentleman named Martin Lindstrom wrote this book, Small Data. And one of the things, one of the takeaways from that book is um, often we think, for instance, purchasing decisions are made in a rational way. Well, what the research tells us is they're actually irrational. So why you buy something may have nothing to do with the, the rationalization of reasons you put, put out. It may have to do with what's called your twin self or this idea of your you know, childlike person. So each one of us has this person inside us, and this is a little bit going down a tangent, but uh, you know, how do we speak to that person that's essentially like going to make these irrational decisions, but it's going to be involved in purchasing decisions? So... So it's a little bit of a tangent, but um, in terms of uh, marketing, um, it's a relevant point. So go to the next slide. So um, in terms of innovation and types, um, I, I didn't do too much open innovation. Uh, I tried to pioneer it in, in the company I was at. Uh, it didn't go over super well, I'll be honest. And open innovation you're going to find is even more difficult in settings that are healthcare, government, because by the nature of the industry, it is difficult to open up your data to somebody else. Uh, you can do a one-way open innovation, but still people want to kind of maintain their secrets and maintain uh, what they produce. So open innovation, while it's a really good, good, I think, goal for a lot of companies, you're going to find that some industries are not just not suited for it. Um, in terms of innovation that you are going to find, you're going to find either producer-led or let's say consumer-led. And I put up um, the Apple by innovation only sign because um, Apple is a really good example, in my opinion, of a uh, producer-led innovation, which means uh, Apple produced the iPhone and told the consumer, this is what you want. So if you think about how powerful that statement is, you know, this wasn't a product of some marketing and focus groups and research. You know, people got together in a room and said, we're going to make a really good product and we know people are going to want it. So think about the risk involved. Think about the groundbreaking, um, the amount of groundbreaking details that went into this and how this phone looked like nothing like phones that came before it. So um, you're going to see some producer-led innovation. It's going to be easier to do in some fields that consumers may not be, like hydraulics, for instance, probably, you know, consumers may have some idea of what they want in hydraulics, but at the end of the day, they want it to work better. So some of this, let's term it black box innovation, is going to be easier to do on a technical side. On a service side, on the, on the retail side, on the marketing side, a lot of times innovation is going to come in terms of like cons consumer-led insight. So um, what I did in my experience uh, with Borset especially was a lot of consumer insights. Uh, and it's a fascinating field if you've ever taken a marketing course in terms of surveying and consumer-led innovation. Uh, you really have to temper what you learn from the consumers with a couple of things. You know, what's doable, um, what's achievable, and, you know, surveys are notorious for not giving you an accurate data because consumers like going back to the martin lindstrom small data example um you know he he essentially his book posits this uh we have all this big data that we're talking about and we may be doing consumer surveying and we may know that 40 percent of the people want to do certain things or want to buy certain things well you know he spends time with let's say 20 consumers and goes into their houses 
and looks at things. And one of the interesting things was, you know, he went into somebody's house and um, he had the answer to this person's people. Um, he had the answers to the survey this person gave, and this person was like a super healthy eater. And then they went into they went to this person's pantry and they found like a whole bunch of junk food. So what that tells you is surveys sometimes are aspirational. So people want to give you the right answer. People want to give you the answer that they aspire to, but what's a, what's the what the reality situation is may not be that exact thing. So it goes back to uh, you know consumer decisions, for instance, uh, in terms of innovation. What drives those decisions may be more irrational. Uh, it may be that we are projecting a persona when we fill out a survey. So digging into some consumer insights and making sure you understand what the subcontext is of all those things is important. Um, so in terms of consumer-led insights, you know, think about. I'm sure you guys are going to do um, a journey map, a consumer customer journey map. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of tools you can use to essentially uh, do something like a consumer-led insight, but um, think about it in terms of like um, what the consumers bring to the table, uh, and you know, it, it's it, journey maps. For instance, I would say are a good tool to start a brainstorming session and, and, and in innovation. So we did a lot of that at, at Borset, and we found some fascinating things um, about our consumers. Uh, not only did we segregate our consumers and segment them, but we also found, you know, what drives purchasing decisions. Uh, and what drives subcontext? In, in other words, let me, I'll give you an example. You're a mom and you're walking into a store and you have two kids. Um, and these kids are like, let's say five and three. So everybody that's been in the Publix can tell you that that person that's going to be in a store is not looking for a 10, 15 minute curated experience that is going to give, give her suggestions about hams from, you know, uh, Spain and like cheeses from Italy. They're looking to get their stuff and get out because the kids are getting impatient. So in terms of your consumer in terms of your innovation you can innovate a couple ways you can get the consumer in and out quickly or you can get the kids entertained and both of those are maybe diverging you know points of thought so that those two things for instance may be starters for a good innovation conversation that could take four to eight to 12 to 16 hours just to brainstorm not to talk about other things so consumer journey we found to be very useful uh, and we found small data or subtext research when you do uh, surveying to be very useful. Uh, and that means, again, in a purchasing example, you may follow somebody from um, from point A to point B, from their, from when the time they wake up to get to the store. In a VA example, you may follow somebody from the time they get up and get to the, let's say, VA for an appointment and back. So maybe, maybe their problem is not at, with the service at the VA. Maybe the problem is how to get to the VA. Maybe it's public transportation. Maybe it's uh, uh, childcare. So all those things provide you enough sub subtext to essentially know where to innovate, uh, and it's very powerful. Um, this is, so this is just illustrates some consumer, some uh, consumer surveying, uh, and essentially how it it can it can be powerful, but it can it can also go sideways pretty quick, and you have to know the subtext of what you're talking about. Um, in terms of a place, in terms of setting, so th this is just one more thing I'll, I'll mention. Um, we found that you know you have to several things matter when you talk about innovation sessions. Um, for instance, the the expectations matter. So uh, when you have an innovation session in your company, let's say you want to bring together four people from a cross-functional perspective, um, make sure that they know what is expected of them in terms of uh, participation. Uh, so you want people to be active participants, right? You want people to understand what the goal or deliverable of the meeting is going to be. Um, and then what we found is you want people to be transported. Uh, and that that's a function of time, place. In other words, if you are going to put together a one hour meeting, a brainstorming meeting in the office, you are not going to get people, I guess, far enough um, out of their no normal daily routine for them to really start thinking in a nonlinear setting. And the reason I say that is because people have limited time. We all have jobs. So you really have to, you know, their managers, if you're bringing four people and the managers of those respective teams have to understand um, the benefit of an innovation session. So, and that innovation session could be eight hours, could be at a Starbucks, could involve icebreakers and different things. But 
you have to transport people in or, enough to, in order to give them license to think outside of the box. You also want to bring in maybe not too many people, but not too few. So let's say you bring in six or seven people, you, you have to have active participation from everybody. And the key to that in these sessions, what I've learned is facilitation. So you have Professor Diasio, who is in my experience, one of the best facilitators there is out there. And you'll find that in, in those brainstorming sessions, design sprints, if you've had him, he is there to bring out the best out of you and to bring out the best out of people that don't want to talk. Because in every group, you're going to have people that are more, you know, the talkers, you know, people that are contribute, they want to contribute less, or but they have stuff to contribute. So your goal, if you have an innovation session as a facilitator, uh, and by the way, if you're going to do innovation, I would highly suggest facil facilitation training because it has to do with um, timing, the methods, the tools, psychology, a lot of different things. But this is this is the crux of being having a good good innovation session. Uh, you may want to take you may want this to take place somewhere else because by the mere virtue of having an innovation session in a different spot, it feels different. It, it looks different. Uh, this example is actually interesting in front of you. There's a table that has square edges. Research shows that uh, tables with square edges are associated with, with a more rigid setting. So if you walk into a room that has the table with, with a round edge or an oval, people may be more willing to talk or may, may be more willing to contribute. And it's a small thing. Um, things like lighting, things like maybe music in the background, um, so all these things are things like switching venues, because if you're going to be sitting there for eight hours, you switch a venue every third, you know, every hour. Uh, and, and how do you do that? So there is definitely a, a method to the madness for innovation sessions. But um, the, the biggest thing I can tell you is um, get top down buy in. So get a champion in your company that's going to help you uh, get a cross functional team, start small and narrow your topic to something that's doable. Uh, in other words, um, you know, and that you co coming out of an innovation session, you should have a crystallized idea or a group of ideas, let's say two or three, you can prototype. That could be a process. Let's say in the case of um, the VA, maybe you have a new process for intake of, uh, of uh, patients, and maybe that process takes place in one of the locations out of the, let's say four or five in the area. In the case of mechanical engineering, let's say you have something that's being done and maybe you pilot a certain thing and it's certainly easier to maybe easier to test maybe ha harder but maybe you do it as a pilot and then you test it with a single consumer or a single setting um in case of um in case of tech data maybe maybe it's again maybe business development maybe you have a different presentation different pitch uh and uh maybe you test it on on a few consumer or a few potential customers that you think would be amenable to that. So there's a lot of different ways to do this, but um, over, overall, uh, the setting matters, um, the facilitation matters, um, and I know it's kind of all over the place here, but um, you'll find that, you know, find out what innovation is for you and your company, um, find out where you can start, uh, and, and the other thing is you're going to find environments like healthcare uh, that are a little bit more rigid. So I'll give you an example for Baycare. One of the things that, for instance, was innovated on is we started making our own PPE recently because we know there's a lack of PPE uh, in this in this COVID era. So there's there's a group of dedicated team members that just make PPE day in and day out for now. Um, we had things like we were buying things like sourcing things like let's say um, exhibits, plastic exhibits of lungs that you could be used to explain to the patient what's happening maybe they have pulmonary disease we took to making that, that ourselves using 3d printing uh, so that cut the cost that down we were able to provide some of our own supply and um, you know it, it made it more streamlined so so innovation is one of those things that it is a mindset uh, and once you it's like uh, it's the matrix right when you take the red pill you can't really go back because once you've seen underneath the veil once you start thinking that way uh, it's very, it, it kind of comes naturally to think about every process and every product in the same way. Um, and it, it is one of those things that um, can help a company. So, um, you know, find find your niche in your company, find find a, you know, a small deliverable you can start with uh, and find a champion uh, and then try to get to get our cross-functional team and learn how to do facilitation. Uh, so that's, that's my experience. Um, the other thing I was going to say about real life experience and innovation, um, you're going to find, 
it's, I, we worked with a lot of companies from, uh, you know, major companies like Deloitte um, that essentially outsource innovation. Uh, and the way they do that is they they buy small startups that may have, you know, they're, they may be, they may have like an innovative way to, to look at a part of a market to companies that do only innovation that this is, this is their stick uh, and consultants to do the same. Um, uh, find podcasts. Uh, Martin Lindstrom is a good person to read. Um, IDEO, if you haven't done that, is a good resource as well. Uh, and uh, and I guess that's all I can contribute now without without questions. So if you have any questions, uh, I guess Steve, th this would be a good time. And I guess sorry I was all over the place, but I'm uh, I was trying to uh, I guess put all this stuff in perspective and context in terms of a real life setting. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Before we open up the floor for Q and A, I kind of want to just highlight some points from from what you all shared that might be relevant to our uh, course and the content. So, for instance, this is what I was hearing: this idea of feedback, connecting with others who have different knowledge, if it's cross disciplinary, getting their buy-in early, kind of enrolling them into this innovation journey. Remember, if you're an evangelist, I mean, that this has a biblical connotation. I mean, that you are trying to persuade, promote something that is different. Uh, so these, these, this behavior is important. Finding a top-down agreement, either through a sponsor or an executive or a champion, uh, who may be, you know, helpful in terms of supporting the project, but also part of this feedback and part of this broader evangelism tools create a business case if it's a business case for your company or find a business case that already exists and how it relates to the, the change this idea of creating a brief that might be for the business case like we have for our project innovation as a grind right might be very sexy but at the same time it, it might be a grind job actually especially in an organization that is has this legacy mindset the role of journey mapping, while we don't touch it on in this course, we certainly touched it on in the management design thinking course. And what I thought was most unique, or at least provoked me, was this idea of, you know, Euros put the one slide up there with the three kind of categories of people who might be open to the idea or innovation you're proposing. The ones that are, yes, let's go. The people who are on the, the wagon, they're kind of in between wait and see, and then the person who's no. And maybe, in fact, one of the biggest challenges or one of the tools and challenges we need to address is how do we move people on that spectrum down to become a believer? And maybe you need a journey map for whatever, I don't know, the transition of the believer, moving them from one category to the other and where you're going to do that in your process or, you know, and it may not need, may need to be detailed or maybe just kind of flag where I'm going to try to move people along to go from not believers to wait and see to being on your side. Um, Steve, can I add one thing? Absolutely. Can I add one thing to that? Um, so the way the, the we used a five step innovation cycle, uh, we did um, we did ideation, then we did uh, design and prototyping, uh, then we did um, testing. So design, sorry, uh, design prototyping, or alpha testing, then uh, full-scale testing and impl implementation. The way that journey looks is it's not a swim lane, it's not flat, it's almost like a funnel if you think about it. In other words, you may have seven people that are SMEs in their fields that start with you on that journey. When you get to design, you may need an, another person from each department, let's say 14, whatever, but that funnel expands, and that's why it's important to get buy-in early because if you think about full implementation, like let's say you come up with a process for patient intake that's gonna be used all over the VA. And it's okay to be, dream big, right? Because that's what innovation is. You're gonna to have to probably change hundreds and thousands of people in organizations. So the quicker you get those champions on your wagon, the better off you are because those people can go to their departments and say, listen, this is gonna save us money. This is a great thing. So your goal is really to be, it, it, you know, we keep saying evangelist and I feel like I'm selling you guys something, but in innovation, a lot of it is essentially like selling the idea because uh, you're going to need people to, you know, to go to these departments, to go to these locations. You, they, they may speak their language. They may have a better understanding of what they need and how to sell it and how to present it. 
And those people can be your champions in those parts of the organization, whether it's regional, whether it's hierarchical, whether it's like anything else. So it, think of the funnel expanding and think about how do you get people on your on your boat or in your cart quicker to get to get there quicker because at the end of the day uh, you know every one of those five stages is crucial you can have a great idea that's designed well prototype well you get to implementation and it fails because you don't have champions in all regional areas in other words we're doing great in new york city but let's say in seattle we we are hitting a roadblock because people are just not buying into it so having those champions in each area in each region in each field is very important and you have to do that early because without that uh, things don't go anywhere and there's going to be you know innovation is <clears throat> painful there'll be places and, and there'll be also departments and places that are not going to work as well as some others right uh, and you have to dedicate some time to those as well so just think of an expanding funnel and think about how to pick up people on the way sorry to hijack no problem I would like to open the floor for questions maybe uh, you have questions about it what was shared how it relates to the content or your own context, because I think there's some excellent good, some good points that we can relate it to. Is there any questions out there or there's a few more points I could share? I have one quick one. So when you talk about expanding the funnel, instead of your funnel starting wide and narrowing, it's actually kind of flipping the funnel over. You start smaller with like your uh, subject matter experts or, um, you know, a smaller group, and then you get more and more buy-in, so the funnel actually gets bigger. You have to do that because what you're going to find is in innovation, innovation sessions have to be productive, so you have to limit the, the amount of people that are in a session. Um, you, I don't know sure how many people you guys have in class, but anything past like seven or ten people, you're going to have a difficult time getting everybody heard, and then those people kind of have to be some of it, some of it, an expert in their field, or they have to provide some, you know, functional feedback. So. Um, you want people that, I, I guess in each department, if you take the example of tech data, if you have a new, um, let's say, sales pitch, you may want to bring in somebody from sales, somebody from business development, somebody from product development, somebody maybe like an executive. Um, and, and, and executives are interesting in, the, in that scenario because there, there's a, there's a um, plus and a minus. The plus is that you get somebody in a room that can actually sign the check and, and say, yeah, we're going to do this. The minus is that having an executive in the room in innovation may um, may present like a hurdle for other people to speak and may make him less likely to speak. So there's definitely, uh, you know, if you find somebody that 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 can that can do both and uh, and if you can facilitate enough to get people heard, that's a good thing. But you want to start small because those people will crystallize your idea or two ideas or three ideas, and you have to have something that you can go back and say. We have an idea that we're ready to put in place. Like we're going to make a new presentation, we're going to do do a new um, uh, new sort of follow up or whatever. So you have to have a crystal, I guess, small nugget of information that you can design and prototype and test. So that's why you kind of start small because you want those people to really be uh, masters of their domain uh, to to provide good feedback. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. There's this is Gisela. Um, one of the things, there's a couple of things. I wrote some notes so that I don't go all over the place because I'm known for that. Um, but I wanted to say that I loved that you said um, that you can innovate in small ways. And um, because I, you know, I work for the government, it's going to be small and I, I'm prepared for that mentally. Um, but I, I can be kind of a disruptor and I'm known for the good idea fairy getting out of the box. And so that's how I'll speak to, you know, my providers. So I'll be in a, you know, in a room with, with a bunch of providers and, Rather than uh, float my idea as the win for the organization or a win for even the customer sometimes, right, with, with the providers, um, I, I try to, I don't want to say spin, but essentially spin my idea for their win, their gain. And it's taken me almost uh, three years uh, to sit with them and see their daily life to find the win. And it's funny because one of my, <laughs> I say it's funny, but one of the recent wins for my providers and now how I try to find innovation for them is a uh, number of clicks. So number of clicks in the patient chart. Um, I was finding that I, you know, I would be in a meeting somewhere and someone brings up this new great idea or this new process that the docs are going to have to do. And I would hear and I would watch the demo and I would see, and I'm counting and I'm like, oh, they want to add 22 clicks per patient. This isn't gonna work. This won't work. 
And so I found myself being the person behind the wagon in your picture, like this isn't going to work, but not in a disruptive, non-innovative way, but in a, they're not going to do this way. And this process will be abandoned and it will not be sustained. And so when I saw your picture that you showed us with the, you know, the, the excited girl in the front pulling the the wagon, that is usually me, um, you know, and then the ones in the, in the middle that are like, well, you know, the, the, the fair weather fans or whatever they're called, right. That are like, if it's going to win, I'll get on the idea. Um, I have found myself oftentimes now, not before, but now that I've worked with the providers and I'm on this side of the healthcare system, I used to work um, on the front line in environmental management and, you know, kind of the, the blue collar side of the house. Um, and now that I'm with the providers, I try to find the wins for them, for the innovation to win for the organization. And so now when I have to present a process that's gonna happen, right? It comes top down, this is what we're doing now. I talk to the providers and say, but don't worry, it's only three clicks. It started with 22 extra. Mama got it down to three for you guys because I love you and I want you to serve veterans and I want you to be happy about you know, this innovation because the patient's gonna win, you're gonna win, we're all gonna win. I have found that that change can start moving. And then I tell them, hey, Rather than them tell us the idea, you tell me maybe what you think we could change that would be better that we're not seeing because we're not you. And so I think that empowering that front line as well can help lead to that innovation that consumer led, but even consumer within your company. So that's what I, I've been um, my, my kind of new focus. I wish I could be, you know, doing different type focus, marketing type focus. But for me, it's been those small wins within to move the wagon right to move the, the the titanic if you will so you 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 make some interesting really relevant points uh and there's a few things i have a lot of notes i'll send you guys the presentation i'll send it to steve you can share but um one of the things that we do talk about is bringing some of those people that most innovation in a corporation fails in middle management the reason it fails is because you have these top level executives visionaries like yeah we're going to do it and then you have these like you know frontline people like analysts that are like the brains and then when it gets to the execution portion, these middle managers are really focused on their numbers, the metrics, the time, and they just don't want to deal with it. They don't want to be in those meetings. But bringing people like at Borsa, we used to bring in distributors and providers. These are the people you see in your publics in the stores delivering, rotating the meats and cheeses because they have a unique perspective. But at the end of the day, to your point, they're going to be the ones doing it. You have to get them on board. The other concept that's really important about innovation is uh, top-down buying is important, but you want to uh, you want it to be eventually more of a push, uh, sorry, more of a pull than a push. What I mean by that is, uh, if you tell somebody something, even if you bring them in, you're going to do this. They're not really. Most people are going to say like, you know, the implication, the psychological implication is, I'm doing something wrong. You're telling me to do something else. I don't want to do it. If you if you make it a win for them and they say this is awesome, how can I get more of this? That's the pull mechanism, which means. They are now pulling the innovation from you, and now you can sell them on different things. So, so it, it sounds like a sales pitch. It is definitely a spin, but what you what you find is that people are not they don't like change. You have to present it in a way that it's not a change; it's an improvement. And guess what? You want this. So I I I get your where you're going with that, and you're absolutely right. People that execute it have to be the ones that actually really want it, because if they don't, it's going to be coming down as a directive. You can only get so far, you know, with a with a stick. You you're going to do better with a carrot in terms of innovation. That was awesome. I really like that. Good points from both. What else? Other questions? All right, Giselle is going to go one more time, and then I'll, I'll stop, guys. I promise. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is you brought up healthcare and uh, kind of the lack of. Um, open innovation. And I wanted to bring up most recently for us, um, we have providers that moonlight at other hospitals, a lot that moonlight at BayCare hospitals, um, their side hustle, if you will. And um, when all of the COVID stuff was happening and, and testing opened up in private sector before it opened up um, at VA um, publicly, right? Of course, we're testing our patients, but not like drive up testing. And when we found out about the drive up testing that was going on at BayCare, I think it was implemented quite quickly and then it kind of pulled back and went away. And for us, we saw that as an opportunity, right? Our doctors are like, hey, we could do a version of this. Gisela, what do you think if we talk to leadership and do um, drive up 
uh, like the thermometer check, right? So drive up temperature check and then drive through triage. So we took versions of what our docs were doing at other, you know, at other entities and kind of modified it to fit into our kind of VA box, right? We have to get approval and all the things have to happen. And um, so I think it's cool that we can do a little bit of that in healthcare, right? Um, also similarly with, with research, right? So it's getting into those research programs. So VA just got into that Mayo study that's using the plasma of COVID, COVID survivors to help patients. And it's been successful at Bay Pines with, with one patient in particular recently. And so for, for me, that's exciting open innovation in a restricted clinical type setting, but it's the way that I, you know, healthcare providers have found to be innovative. So I think that that's exciting. It's not, um, you know, like regular innovation the way we talk about it, but it's a different real life innovation that's a little messy, but, um, and a little dangerous, but equally awesome. So the good thing about that is you, the, the, that's a really, also a really good point, which is innovation is situational, right? There's going to be situations where you're expected to move fast. And most of us, even in healthcare, this is a unique situation with COVID, but, you know, industry, the market in general, the everything is moving exponentially faster because of the internet, because of globalization, different things. So, so this agile approach to innovation, which is what's going to happen, it's not going to be like you have six months and we'll see you on the back end. In, in a lot of things, especially like, let's say, um, consumer technology, in six months, whatever you come up with is going to be like out of date, right? There's a new iPhone, there's a new phone, um, there's a new Samsung phone. So you have to really think in agile terms, which means, uh, you know, you may not put the perfect product out there. It may be like something quick and put together, but there has to be a mechanism within the organization to be able to react quickly. The other point I was going to make is like um, when, when we talk about the innovation being a grind, uh, you guys that have everybody has a cell phone on this phone call. I, uh, Apple is essentially now a laggard in innovation, right? Samsung is doing the what Apple is doing is what Samsung did like in the past. So the point I'm making is uh, innovation is connected to people like visionaries like Steve Jobs, right? Because the direction of the company changed completely. And it's also it is a grind because you have to be investing time and money and resources and in, and taking risks over and over again to be able to make money. Apple said, we're just going to take a break and we're going to sit in the back and let Samsung innovate uh, and do that stuff. So um, so it is something that may, you know, you may see companies go up and down in terms of like who's going to be innovative, who's not. And it's all, almost like the airlines. It's almost like game theory. If one company is innovating, we're going to sit in the back and we're going to, you know, three months later, come up with the same product, maybe 50 bucks cheaper. So so there's a very interesting concept, but in general, the world is moving exponentially faster. Um, the opportunities for innovation are going to grow because the standard process of let's sit down and think about it and, and take three to six months to do it is not working anymore. Things have to be done quickly. And the only way to do things quickly is to do it through an agile approach where you put your best guess out there, do something that may not be perfect, but something that you know serves the function and then go back and refine it. The other portion about um, the other thing that brings up is that innovation is also incremental. So it kind of if you think about the funnel, it never really stops because eventually you go back to maybe not the beginning, but testing. Maybe you found something after implementation that could be done better um, throughout the whole thing. And maybe you go back to the beginning. Maybe you go back to step two. But think about it as like revolving pattern of innovation because it's really a process and it's a journey versus like we've gotten there, we've innovated, it's time to go home and have a beer. Wonderful. In fact, this leads a, a good segment or segue into our current module, which we uh, expand this concept of open innovation. And as Euros mentioned, um, Samsung and Apple, they compete in certain products which we learned a lot about product innovation, or particularly open innovation with products. But in this next module, we talk about opening uh, or moving open innovation into services. And while Apple certainly may be behind in some of the technology uh, and functionality that, that the phone has compared to the Samsung phone, it may be that they're moving into uh, maybe services innovation or packaging and realizing, so the underlying argument is this of, of service innovation. Any product can be commoditized, meaning 
you are competing with other people who can always produce something similar at a cheaper rate, right? Cheaper. That's why we, we outsource, went to different places in the world. But Henry Chesbro and those who are, who are advocates for open service suggest that we can potentially get out of this commoditization trap, which is what he calls it, and because we can use the product one way, but innovate around services in order to create bigger margins, to lock in the customer, to create different business models, regardless and not directly compete on the direct product that we're creating. So one example, would we could suggest Apple, who may not be making the top of the line product in terms of speed or camera or whatever the case may be, but maybe they're saying, because we have a large user base, install base, and we have these other types of um, uh, devices or services and, or uh, we'll say devices particularly, and uh, we have a broader platform, this iOS platform, we can now sell you a subscription-based model. Um, and I believe, they're first of all, they're doing this with their Apple Plus, but we can, and they've done that with their Apple Care part, but we can easily conceive that they're moving this toward providing a broader value-based bundle, but we're now we may even call it a, a rundle, which is a recurring revenue service-based model, where maybe you're going to be able to get your phone, your health, your internet, your TV. So we can suggest that maybe they're pivoting to this platform approach or and services service model as, as a result. Another good example of this where you can think of GE avi Aviation. And that's that's actually a good example in here or this new book called uh, Open Innovation, Going Beyond the Results and Hype, things like this. This just came out this year. But GE Aviation, who sells um, and competes with Rolls Royce for the engines of airlines or airplanes, right? We can sell an airplane to air or an engine to Airbus, or we can send an air uh, engine to um, Boeing or the whatever, Bombardier, whoever makes airplanes. But instead, they will lease that and then make money off of the services as well. So we will not compete on producing the cheapest engine, but we will have a value add, provide services in terms of whatever, maintenance and the secondary parts to fix that, uh, which is seen to be a greater margin, et cetera, and then only lease it that at, a, at a lower rate than the person would purchase uh, an industry or a company like Airbus or Boeing would purchase it. So that would be an example of a traditional where you would think of just selling the product, but instead you're selling the service and the, the maintenance on top of that is an example of open service innovation. Um, I think may I give an example of, of that yes. at please. I say, may I give an example of that at Tech Data right now? Two years ago, we rolled out tech as a service. And so you could take your basic Chromebook, you could take some higher end notebooks, and essentially we would give companies a good, better, and best choice. And instead of having to, for say for a school district, um, or even just one particular school that may not have their own IT department and didn't have the ability to keep up with um, the maintenance on the notebooks, now what they do is they can fund them over three years and they may start as little as $10 per, uh, we'll say Chromebook per student. And so now in three years, when that's up, they get a refresh of a brand new product and they don't have to come up with $100,000 for the school all at once, a, you know, three million for a school district. And it's a service-based model, just like you're talking about, where it keeps um, for the OEMs for an HP, an Acer, a Lenovo, or a Dell, it keeps their product cycle refreshed within the schools so that they're not trying to use a very out of date model. Cause as you were saying, it's very agile these days, things change so quickly, but for the schools, it also doesn't mean that they have to come up with that big chunk of change every year or every three years. And it's, I'm not gonna lie, it hasn't been easy because as you know, if you don't use your budget within a year, you lose, you risk losing that budget the next year. But um, 
they kicked it off two years ago, Tech Data uh, US did, and then this past year they kicked it off in Canada. And it's taken some time to build up some steam, but it's been very successful. But if you look at some of the other companies, an Intel or an HP, they have uh, something called device as a service. Um, ours is tech as a service. But we can actually build in imaging for them. We can uh, burn their school logo into the notebook. We can do, uh, we can actually deploy people, or yeah, deploy people to go out on site and uh, deploy it to an entire school system. So uh, I thought that was a very big uh, piece of innovation for tech data in the last couple of years. Great, thank you, that was a great example. Um, I do wanna be mindful of time. We're, we're two minutes over the schedule. Uh, if I could just kind of wrap up, let's, but first let's give Euros a big round of applause for being here, thank you, uh, appreciate you know, your support and, and wisdom on the topic. A um, couple of things that, that stand out. While we, related to what Euro shared, when you're running an event or running a session, um, was this idea of kind of setting the tone or the environment's important and that people are, are coming from, you know, their daily work and then they have to somehow change their mindset. And I want to suggest even these small exercises and the icebreakers that we do, if it's the big toe or Pecha Kucha or life story, you know, we might think they're fun. We don't know how they play. I would very much suggest that these potentially could be something that breaks that chasm, that, that mindset or, or prepare someone to go from a transition of this, like, I don't know, routine thing that they do in their work to maybe a, a setting. And I don't know if that happens before they go in, as they go in or whatever, but these are tools. And, and I think I've seen it work in our class, but I also wanna suggest it's, it could be utilized in, in the sessions that you hold in your organization as well. So other tools that we can apply. Just to wrap up regarding the midterm and maybe some runway for the final, uh, there was one company or one group, and I don't remember which one, who started to use the tool of surrealism because we do have we did have the module of surrealism, and I thought that was a wonderful way of helping to frame how that module connected to the project and help how, how it framed your your solution or the problem. So excellent again, uh, wonderful ad adoption of the concept. I want to suggest that please. For the final, be explicit and articulate the concepts and approaches that you're using for your solution. And I want to suggest that these concepts, approaches are not just here's how we're doing it or we're touching it. I think they can be embedded in part of the persuasion and the story of your presentation, which elevates the value of the solution that elevates what you're trying to accomplish and can be a rhetorical to device in terms of getting people on board. So I, I think you can stretch those um, and add to the logic of what happens throughout the before, during, and after the, the, the solution. So use them as an ass asset to develop your logic of why the innovation, I think. Continue connecting the story, the data, the comparisons. Uh, some groups did more research than others. Some uh, maybe highlighted it, some didn't. I also would like to suggest some groups chose to focus the presentation on who their audience would be. I would say that's a good approach, meaning let's pretend this is not homework and this is not class and I'm not the only person who look at it but that we're actually trying to convince our audience of who we would want this to change for. So put our consulting hat on, put our role play on, put our um, real life, I guess, and, and outside of just me looking at that. So, because I think that helps us uh, in the presentation. So who's the audience make, instead of just the person in the course. So those are some things that I've come up with that I would like for you guys to continue. Um, the next module, like I said, moves to service innovation. It also talks about open business models. Consider how these tie to your solutions. 
Um, I think there can be different ways to mo monetize your ideas or potentially make them financially sustainable or how you're purposely using uh, knowledge. And I, I, I want to re remind you guys that open innovation is this idea of using knowledge or managing knowledge flows purposefully for pecuniary purposes that tie to the business model. That's the definition that Henry Chesborough gives. So it's a strategy, it's an approach, and if we're not managing it, it purposely, then we run a risk of doing things ad hocly. We do run things of, of mismanagement. We're not doing things with intention. And I wanna suggest that it's through this intention and through this purposeful strategy of managing knowledge that can benefit us um, or benefit and access the, 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 the revenue and rent even if we don't utilize that technology or knowledge, this is open innovation. And it's not just a random approach. It is a purposeful and intentful, uh, which makes it a strategy, makes it approach, uh, because without that, you run this risk of kind of a wild, wild west or random, and we don't learn from it. We don't, we may miss opportunities. We don't maximize it. We're not able to replicate it at scale where we may not, may not be able to learn from it. We, we may not be including everyone or, or making best practices as well. So kind of want to bring it back to highlighting, you know, so we're not calling everything open innovation, but it has to be purposeful uh, of managing these inflows and outflows the, for pecuniary or non-pecuniary purposes. And, and for this definition, tie it to the business model, but it can be adopted, as Euro said, and you guys have defined your own um, innovation in your organizations. So again, I think this has been a, another great session. Appreciate you guys spending this Saturday. I want to open the floor for questions for the remaining, is it two weeks of this semester, semester, class, course? Uh, anything that I might need to clarify, address? I'm good pretty over here. Okay. I actually have a question that goes back to, I think it was week two of the class when we did, I want to say it was our group charter. I don't think that's actually been graded yet. Uh, I will check. Um, okay. okay, I'll check. And you guys should always, if okay. there's been, I don't know if there has been an issue. You know, we've been meeting every week, but I haven't heard if there's been any issue within groups or maintaining. We have smaller groups, so hopefully we're keeping each other accountable, but we should be going back to that. And you can always change and readopt or modify the, the group charter. So if it's not graded, I will take a look. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Is my video better than last week? To be honest, it's not I'm very fluent here. Uh, can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, I'm having a lot of issues with it today. So my presentation. I can hear you, Yin Khan. Yeah, what I'm saying is, uh, uh, Dr. Dashu, I cannot hear you very clearly here, and your image is kind of like a flick in between. I don't know if everyone else see the same thing here. I can see and hear you all perfectly. Um, Guess I lucked out. <laughs> uh, same here. My camera, uh, the video kept freezing, not during Euro's presentation, but more, um, more wow. towards the end of it. Everything started freezing, but I've had a lot of internet issues this week, so it could be within my own walls. It's probably because Ray and I are Seminoles that everything's working out for us. That's the life of an Oh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> um, I, maybe there's, I didn't have my video off. Maybe there's some best practices when someone's presenting or whatever, we turn it off. But is the, for those who can see me, is it clearer than last week? I think it, it's pretty clear. Like you freeze for like half a second every once in a while, but it's clear enough to okay. kind of make sense of what you're saying. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll work through those issues or whatever, but I appreciate you guys' feedback. Uh, any other thoughts or questions before we wrap up? Um, I'll just say that, you know, I went through the videos for this module this week, and I think I liked it the best so far, so personally. Is, is that the module three? 
Yeah, yeah. about the services innovation. So it's a different way of looking at innovation for me because, you know, I am coming from a traditional engineering and manufacturing type company. Wonderful. I, I, I think it just starts to expand it. Um, maybe the first few modules is getting a footing so we all have a common base. But I certainly think that this is pushing the boundaries and we're going in that direction and I'll, I'll continue, you know, how to, how to work through that. Um, next question. Do we want to meet again next Saturday? Yeah. Yes. I'll be here. Okay. Perfect. Oh, so let's tentatively schedule for next Saturday. I'll confirm there is one other alum that I would like to involve, get involved and see if we can um, have them come back to class or teams or whatever and um, move from there. All right. It's been a wonderful Saturday morning. Have a great day. We will see you next week, but I will confirm. All right. Thanks, All right. everybody. Thank you, Thanks, guys. guys. Thank you. Have Thank a you. good weekend. Thanks, Euros, if you're still on. I don't know.